Hello, and welcome to today's webinar on discovering the benefits of specialty media. I'm Bonnie Marsick, an R&D scientist here at Science Cell Research Laboratories, where I work on optimizing specialty media. For those unfamiliar with Science Cell, we are a biotechnology company located in Carlsbad, California, near San Diego. For over 15 years, we've been providing a large array of primary cells, specialty media, and cell-based assays to researchers worldwide. Today, we'd like to share with you things to consider when selecting media and demonstrate how specialty media can dramatically improve your primary cell cultures. Today, I'll first be briefly talking about the composition of cell culture medium and highlighting some important quality features to consider. I'll then discuss why using specialty media for your primary cell cultures is the right choice and how to choose the right media and supplementation. I'll end by showing some data that demonstrate how culture media choice has a dramatic impact on the quality of your primary cell cultures. Throughout the webinar, I'll also be highlighting different types of specialty media we offer at Science Cell that may be useful in your research. Immediately following our presentation, there will be a Q&A session with members of the Science Cell R&D team to address any questions you have. As a courtesy, please save your questions and comments for the Q&A portion at the end. Please note any specific references with the relevant slide number located in the lower left corner. Also, if you'd like to further reference this presentation, it will be available for download tomorrow. Many researchers routinely use cell culture media in their experiments, but don't really think much about its components. I'd like to begin by briefly reviewing what is in culture media so you can better understand its complexity and the drawbacks in designing and making your own specialty media. First are inorganic salts, like sodium and calcium. These perform important functions like improving cell attachment, as in the case of calcium chloride, and maintaining the osmotic balance of the cell. Osmolality is the saltiness of the media, which should be close to the osmolality of the inner cell. If the media is hypoosmotic, the cell will swell with water, whereas a media that is too salty or hyperosmotic, the cell will shrink. Both of these are damaging to the cell. Here at Science Cell, we pay close attention to the osmolality of all of our media lots to ensure they fall within the optimal range. Another important component are amino acids, which cells use to build proteins and grow. There are nine essential amino acids which can't be synthesized by cells and thus must be supplied in the media at an adequate concentration. There are 11 non-essential amino acids which can be synthesized by cells. However, during periods of rapid growth, synthesis cannot keep up, and so supplementing media with non-essential amino acids also aids in cell growth and viability. Also consider that different types of primary cells may require different combinations or concentrations of amino acids, which can make optimizing your own medium time-consuming. In addition to salts and amino acids, cells also need energy. This is often supplied in the media by sugars, like D-glucose or galactose. Normal human blood glucose is around 5.5 millimolar, and many media are formulated around this concentration. However, some classical media, like DMEM, have versions with a much higher glucose concentration, either for high-density suspension cultures or because some cell lines grow better at this concentration. Vitamins are also necessary for cell viability and growth and are important cofactors for enzymes. They're present in serum, but in low serum or serum-free conditions, vitamins can be supplemented in the basal media as they can't be synthesized by cells. In addition to maintaining osmotic balance and providing nutrients and energy, a really important component of media is the buffering system, which keeps the media at a consistent pH, generally between 7.2 and 7.4 for primary cells. As cells grow and proliferate, the media progressively becomes more acidic, 
the cells consume nutrients and produce metabolites, and primary cells are particularly sensitive to changes in pH. If you're using medium with phenol red, you'll see this as the color changes from light pink to yellow over time. It's important to pay attention to this color change, as you'll want to change the medium before it becomes yellow. At Science Cell, we recommend changing the media on primary cells every two to three days, but more frequently as the cells become more dense and deplete the nutrients more rapidly. In most cases, phenol red has no detrimental effect on cells. However, it can interfere in some flow cytometry applications and act as a weak estrogen. So some researchers prefer to use phenol red free medium. At Science Cell, we do offer phenol red free versions of all of our media. There are two main types of buffers commonly used. Sodium bicarbonate is a more natural, non-toxic buffer that also provides nutrition to the cells. Bicarbonate buffered media requires the use of a 5% CO2 incubator to counteract a rise in pH under atmospheric conditions. The other buffer commonly used is HEAPS, which has the advantage of being a stronger buffer than bicarbonate at the 7.2 to 7.4 range, but it can be toxic to some cells at high concentrations. Media buffered solely with HEAPS does not require a CO2 incubator. <clears throat> Finally, cells require proteins and lipids, which have been classically provided by serum. Serum is a complex mixture of vitamins, growth factors, hormones, lipids, and proteins like albumin and transferrin. It aids in cell attachment and acts as a buffer by binding and neutralizing toxic substances. Serum has been critical to the successful culture of many cell types. However, it also has continuously rising cost, lots of lot variability, and is undefined. For these reasons, there has been a move toward eliminating or reducing serum in culture media, which I will talk about more later. There are some commercially available general serum replacement products on the market, but these have not produced results equivalent to serum for many primary cells. That is why Science Cell has worked to develop serum-free specialty media for specific primary cell types. In addition to the media composition, there are some other factors to consider when evaluating the quality of your culture media. One of these factors is endotoxin levels. Endotoxins are lipopolysaccharides in the cell membrane of gram-negative bacteria and are shed during intense bacterial growth or upon lysing. Different cells have different sensitivities to endotoxins, but primary cells are especially sensitive. Science Cell uses ultra-purified water for all of our cell culture media and reagents, and we perform testing to ensure low endotoxin levels in our products. We also only use serum with very low endotoxin levels and test all serum lots with our primary cells. Finally, an obvious but critical part of culture media is sterility. Culture media is by design hospitable for growth. So bacteria and fungi, if given the chance, will thrive in it. It's very important to remember to use good sterile technique when handling your reagents and cultures and monitor for signs of contamination, like turbidity or rapid change in color. Keep in mind that water baths are common sources of contamination, so be extremely cautious when putting cell culture items in water baths. Many researchers use antibiotics or antifungal agents to keep any chance of contamination at bay, though these are not necessary if properly handled. At Science Cell, we perform sterility testing on all of our culture products to ensure they are contamination free. And our specialty media kits come with penicillin streptomycin as a separate aliquot, which you can choose to add to your media or leave out. As you can see, the multitude of ingredients and features to consider when designing a quality culture media can be daunting, especially when trying to customize a medium for primary cell. Fortunately, there are many choices of commercially available media to choose from. So now that we have a basic understanding of culture media composition, let's talk about the different types of media and their applications. The different types of culture media available commercially include classical, nutrient, and specialty. 
With so many options, how do you select which type of medium to use? Well, this depends on whether you're working with a cell line or a primary cell. Classical and nutrient media were the first developed to grow cells ex vivo and were crucial for early studies in cell biology. Classical and nutrient media, on average, contain around 30 to 50 components and may require supplementation with serum at 10% or higher. Many variations of these media have since been developed and are now used successfully with cell lines. If you are working with primary cells, it is important to note that these cells require additional supplementation, so a classical or nutrient medium may not be sufficient to support your primary cells. Specialty media is typically more complex than classical media, with 60 to 80 components on average. As the name suggests, each specialty media is optimized for a specific cell type. Specialty media are often designed to be used with little or no serum, so the media is supplemented with specific growth factors and hormones to compensate. So how do you choose which specialty media is right for your primary cells? Consider the unique characteristics of primary cells compared to cell lines. Cell lines are immortalized cells or cells derived from tumors. They are typically very proliferative, adapted to 2D culture, and tend to be more resilient to culture conditions. Researchers use cell lines because they're easy to grow and transfect, but they do have the disadvantage of no longer resembling a normal cell in vivo. For many cell lines, classical or nutrient media in conjunction with high serum levels works very well. Conversely, primary cells are taken from their 3D host tissue and transferred to a 2D environment. Therefore, normal primary cells have a more complex nutritional requirement and tend to be more sensitive to the culture conditions. Specialty medium is a better choice for primary cells because it is more nutritionally complex. Furthermore, primary cells do not proliferate indefinitely, and cultures may also have a few contaminating cells present. A specialty medium contains less serum and is supplemented with growth factors and hormones optimized for a specific cell type. It helps to selectively support the cell you're interested in and reduce the growth of any contaminating cells that may be present. In addition, because serum is undefined mixture of many different components, it may also contain factors that result in differentiation or senescence of your primary cell type, which also limits the expansion capacity. So although they're more challenging to work with, the advantage of using primary cells is that they're more representative of normal cells in vivo, so your data will be more biologically relevant. As I'll show later, Using the right specialty medium can also keep primary cells in a healthier, more in vivo-like state. Therefore, there are many good reasons to use specialty media in your primary cell cultures. Many independent labs have worked to optimize their own culture medium for primary cells, usually using a classical or nutrient media as the basal medium, but have spent considerable resources in the process. To eliminate this labor-intensive process, we have already developed over 70 different specialty media designed to support many unique primary cell types, such as endothelial cells, neurons, astrocytes, epithelial cells, smooth muscle cells, and microglia, among many others. All of our specialty media is either low serum or serum-free. Here are some examples of our easy-to-use complete media kits. All of our kits come with the basal media, the growth supplement, which contains hormones and growth factors specific for the primary cell type, FBS in the case of low serum media, and penicillin streptomycin. All of the components within each kit have been formulated to work in combination. Just add the components into the basal medium and it's ready to use. All of our media should be used in a 37 degree incubator with 5% CO2. Shown on the left is our endothelial cell media kit with an image of our human hepatic sinusoidal endothelial cells growing well in it. Shown on the right is an example of one of our serum free media, neuronal media, and a rat hippocampal neuron cultured with this media. We also have over 30 complete ready to use serum free specialty media 
As I mentioned before, serum can cause differentiation of primary cells, and it can interfere with some cell-based assays. Serum-free media can have additional advantages for specific cell types. Next, I'd like to highlight just a few of these cell types and discuss why serum-free media can be beneficial. Serum-free media for cardiac myocytes has several advantages. Cardiac myocyte cultures can be challenging to work with because they do not proliferate and often contain some contaminating fibroblasts. Our serum-free cardiac myocyte media is formulated to selectively support cardiac myocyte cell viability while retaining their cell type specific markers like tropomyosin and sarcomeric alpha actinin. The advantage of using this medium is the absence of serum limits fibroblast proliferation and any assays you're performing won't have serum as a confounding variable. To our knowledge, this is the only commercially available serum-free media designed for normal primary cardiac myocytes and it works well with cells from human, mouse, and rat. Another cell type that benefits from serum-free conditions are mesenchymal stem cells. These cells have tremendous therapeutic potential because of their ability to develop into cells that produce fat, cartilage, bone, tendons, and muscle. Serum-containing medium can reduce their multipotency over time in culture. In addition, researchers investigating transplantation applications of these cells want to avoid serum because of inconsistencies from lot to lot and the risk of transmitting zoonotic diseases. Our serum-free medium is chemically defined and designed for optimal growth of normal mesenchymal stem cells in vitro and can be used with all of our tissue-derived mesenchymal stem cells listed here. In this medium, cells retain their multipotency and can be differentiated into osteoblasts, adipocytes, and chondrocytes using our respective differentiation media. Now that I've introduced you to some of the advantages of specialty media, I'd like to show some data which clearly demonstrates these benefits. As I previously mentioned, each primary cell type has unique nutritional requirements. An endothelial cell, for example, is very different from an epithelial cell. Conversely, an epithelial cell from an animal may also have different requirements than that from a human. While this is not always the case, some media will work well across species. It's important to remember that the same cell types from different organisms may prefer different media. For example, these are primary renal proximal tubular epithelial cells from human, mouse, and rat. The left images show human cells grown in epithelial cell media, or EPICM, optimized for these human cells. When we try to grow the same cell type isolated from mice in either the human optimized medium or the animal optimized medium, it's evident from the growth and morphology that the animal cells prefer the animal medium. On the right, a similar result is seen with the rat cells. Their growth is much better in the medium optimized for animal cells. These show that the same primary cell type from different organisms may require different media conditions. At ScienceL, we ensure that whenever possible, our media works well across different species. When this is not the case, we work to develop media for these exceptions. Some examples of these are animal-specific media for epithelial cells and astrocytes, shown here. We also offer a rat endothelial cell media, which works well with our rat microvascular endothelial cells and helps maintain brain endothelial cell morphology, as well as a mouse parasite media, shown here. These come as complete ready-to-use kits, and as you can see, the cells grow nicely in their respective media. In addition to species-specific differences, next I'd like to show some data that demonstrates how using an optimized specialty medium can make a difference in primary cell cultures and subsequent experiments. To demonstrate the effect of basal media and supplementation on primary cell growth, I've chosen human umbilical vein endothelial cells, or HUVEC, as I'll refer to them moving forward. I chose these cells because HUVEC are widely used and are a bit easier to grow compared to other endothelial cells. Therefore, 
any differences observed would likely be similar or greater with even more challenging endothelial cells. I'm comparing three different media. The first is our Cyan Cell Endothelial Cell Media, or ECM kit, which includes basal media, 5% FBS, and an endothelial cell growth supplement called ECGS. The number two condition shows cells with the same supplements of 5% FBS and ECGS, but with the basal medium as DMEM F12, a commonly used and generally very supportive classical nutrient media. Lastly, condition three is also DMEM F12 as the basal medium, but with 10% FBS and no ECGS. And this is a popular combination used by many researchers. At passage one, the cells were seeded at the same initial density. And if we look at the HUVAC growth and morphology after just three days, we're already seeing differences. The cells in the ECM condition one have grown more with the best, most compact morphology. Cells in condition two are growing second best, while the worst growth and morphology is seen in condition three. If we look nine days later, we find these differences are even more pronounced. The number three condition of DMEM F12 with 10% serum actually never reached confluency and were never subcultured. The cells just became very large. These images show that both the basal medium and the type of supplementation have a large effect on cell growth and morphology. When we look at the cell proliferation further via the population doubling over 10 days, we can see that cells in the endothelial cell media grew the fastest, while the number two condition had 37% less growth. This comparison shows that using an optimized basal media can make a significant difference in the growth rate of these primary cells. The HUVAC in the number three condition of DMEM F12 with 10% FBS did exhibit some initial growth, as seen by a small increase in cell number after three days, but after 10 days actually had a net loss. Importantly, the morphology of these cells was also suboptimal. So in conclusion, these data demonstrate that using an optimized basal medium and the right supplementation is important for achieving good growth and morphology. Remember that researchers use primary cells because they want a more physiologically relevant model of cells in vivo. These morphological changes seen over time in vitro could reflect changes in gene expression, rendering your data less relevant. To further investigate whether these morphological changes result in functional changes, we looked at gene expression of cells in these three media conditions. We chose a selection of genes from our science cell gene query qPCR array kits, including the human angiogenesis and human endothelial cell biology kits, as well as a few primer sets from our catalog of individual primers. We chose six categories of genes, including endothelial or angiogenesis markers, shown in red, cytoskeletal genes, shown in blue, genes for endothelial to mesenchymal transition, shown in purple, proliferation and survival genes, shown in yellow, a senescence gene, shown in green, and transcription factors, shown in orange. The last column in gray shows the controls, such as five housekeeping genes, genomic DNA control, positive PCR, and no template controls. The expression levels are normalized to the housekeeping genes for each comparison. If we look at gene expression after 10 days in the DMEM F12 with 5% FBS and ECGS condition number two, relative to the ECM condition number one, we see several changes in gene expression. These include relative decreases in endothelial and angiogenesis markers, an increase in the cytoskeletal and apoptosis genes, as well as genes associated with senescence and endothelial to mesenchymal transition. These data further suggest that using an optimized basal media in vitro can help keep primary cells closer to their original state. 
If we look at gene expression levels in the DMEM F12 with 10% FBS condition, number three, relative to ECM, number one, we also see a decrease in endothelial and angiogenesis markers, but see an even larger fold increase in cytoskeletal, apoptosis, and senescence genes, which complement the reduced growth and enlarged morphology we observed two slides previously. This shows that the right supplementation, in this case, low serum and an optimized growth supplement, are important for maintaining endothelial cell markers, as well as cell viability, morphology, and proliferation. We also examined gene expression over time in the ECM condition by comparing passage three versus passage one. Of all of the genes examined, we only saw two endothelial cell marker genes increase. This suggests that cells in our optimized endothelial cell media kit not only have good growth and morphology, but retain their endothelial-like state in culture. So, these data have demonstrated how choosing the right media can impact the health of your primary cells in culture, and the happier your primary cells are, the more relevant your results will be. At ScienceL, we have invested the time and energy to optimize specialty media for each primary cell type, which is more cost effective than developing and making your own supplemented classical or nutrient medium. So in summary, I've discussed the complexity of culture media and the differences between classical nutrient and specialty media. I also highlighted the role of serum and supplementation in specialty media and when it can be beneficial to use serum-free media. And finally, I hope I've shown some convincing data to demonstrate that using optimized specialty media is the best choice for your primary cultures due to the difference it can make on growth, morphology, and gene expression. We hope you found this webinar informative. Please visit our website to find some of the products I've talked about today, as well as the other products and services ScienceL has to offer. Also, check out our previous webinars on qPCR and primary cell culture. And now I'd be happy to take your questions. Okay, so we have a question. How does science cell media compare to other commercially available specialty media? Well, first, our growth supplements are supplied in a single aliquot whereas some other companies supply separate tubes for each component. The advantage to this one tube is that it's easier and less time consuming to use, and it reduces the potential for pipetting errors or contamination. And in addition, our media kits are high quality, but priced competitively to help stretch those grant dollars. And we're continuously working on improving our specialty media so it provides the best results for your primary cells. Another question, can I use science cell primary cells with my own media or media from a different company? So science cells, normal human cells have been cultured and tested in our complete growth medium and have adapted to this formula. If you use other media for culturing science cells, human cells, um, this may yield unsatisfactory growth results due to the adaptation process. So we really recommend the use of our specialty media for culturing the normal human cells. I have another question. I'm interested in one of your endothelial cell media, but I'd like it without certain components. Is this possible? Yes, we do offer custom variations of our media. So just contact sales at sciencecellonline.com and they can issue you a quote. Like another question is, what is the shelf life of your media? So it may depend on the product, but in general, our basal media is good for one year from the date of manufacture, and growth supplements are good for two years from the date of manufacture if stored properly. So once you add the supplements to the basal media, it's good for one month. Oh, 
Well, if there's no further questions, um, we'll conclude the webinar and thank you for attending.